Good morning, OCV. We're glad you're here today. It's a beautiful fall day. I am just so grateful for how nice of a fall we've had. I know we need rain. It can come the other days of the week, but we'll take these dry Sundays. A couple quick things. We have first-time visitor bags. If you're here for the first time, grab one of those. Or if you've been here for the first time before and didn't get a chance to grab one, they're over there. We also have kids craft stuff this week. Amy, you want to hold up what it looks like over there? All right. Yeah, so if your kiddos want to make a craft, we just ask that you make sure you pick up the remains. You know how these oriental crafts are? You can leave like 50 little circles of like the back of stickers. Just make sure we leave the park better than the way we found it. All right, Julia has an announcement, and then we'll go to worship. Good morning. So next Saturday is a day of local action for a global end to human trafficking summit. It's worldwide, and George and I are hosting at our home at 1 p.m. on Saturday um, the broadcast that they're sharing. It's through um, Christine Kane and her husband. Um, they started A21, and they um, give us education on what we can do locally to you know, be more aware of human trafficking in our area, as well as what we can do globally to help. But just showing up makes you more aware, and um, it, you provide a part in, in ending and abolishing this slavery that's going on right now around the world. So you can come to our house at 1 next Saturday for this event, or you can just grab one of these cards that I put on the table, and anybody can sign up this week and be you can watch it from your house and just be your own host. Thanks. Which number I'll turn it up? All right, let's worship Jesus together. If you want to stand, you can. It's up to you. Um, the lyrics, there's lyric sheets over on the table, or you can pull them up on the OCV Facebook page, too. his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name the sun comes up it's a new day dawn it's time sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh
that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever
That is who you are. 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 That is who you that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see Never stop, never stop working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Way bigger, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are thank you jesus for being our way maker our promise keeper for just being who you are lord the times when we don't know what you're doing, we can't feel where you are. We can trust your promise that you're still here. You're still making a way. Thank you for being with us, Jesus. Just bless Charlie as he comes to speak this morning. We're going to see how, we, how it goes today with the wind in the microphone. We'll hope for the best. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful for these kind of days. Whether or not we're having church in the park or not, I'm grateful for them. And then when we're having church in the park, I'm especially grateful for them. So thank you, God. We are grateful. So... We're going to get started in just a second, but I want to, I want to just ask the Lord to bless what we're doing today. Um, and just know, you know, we know that people are dealing with all kinds of things out there. And, and please don't hesitate to let me, let Amy, let the board know if you're going through something. Sometimes things happen and we don't even know about what's going on. But we do know some things going on and we know people are dealing with a lot right now. 
So just know you're in our prayers, you're in our thoughts, and don't hesitate to reach out. I've been doing some uh, porch meetings, and we're happy to do a few things like that. We won't, don't want you to feel alone. If you're here for the first time, my name's Charlie. My wife is back there with our kiddos who are running around, uh, and uh, we, we are happy to pastor this church. God's been good. So let's go to him in prayer. Father, we are grateful for your provision. We pray that you would continue to provide for us in every way. Provide jobs for those who need it. Provide healing for those who need it. Lord, as a church, we come to you and say, show us the path forward. Let us make wise decisions as we think about returning to indoor worship, as we think about what the future holds for Oil City Vineyard. We're just a little part of your big church, God, but we know you care about us. So show us the way. And I pray that you would guide me this morning as I teach on a subject that many of us think about especially in tough times. Lead me, lead us through your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so if you're here for the first time, you've lucked out. We're just talking about the end of the world. So here you are. Um, don't, we don't do this too often at Oil City Vineyard. In fact, I don't think I really have, except to talk about the kingdom of God. But today we are. And there's a few reasons for that, be partially because I've had a handful of people come up to me saying, have you seen this prophetic word, or have you heard this? And I think someone's telling me the world's going to end any minute. And I'm like, okay, well, let's all just like take a deep breath, and let's think about things. But you might have heard that kind of stuff too, or you might be thinking that. And I thought, why not talk about the end of the world, when at least some people in our culture are thinking about it, and see if God can show us anything. How do we think? I guess the re reality is, how do you think as a Christian? How do you think Christianly about the end of the world? That's what we're going to talk about. And the reality is, is a lot of people really are talking about it. What people like, I mean, I've had people share face, um, YouTube videos with people that look like they just literally crawled out of bed and had this prophetic word for the whole world to like people who are really well-known pastors, you know, and write books like, with titles like, is this the end, you know, and they make a lot of money off it, which maybe my next book needs to say, is this the end or something on it, because it might sell a lot more, but uh, people make a lot of money off of speculating about when the end is coming, and there's always another well-known person saying, I have this insight, listen to me, but we're going to think about how to think Christianly about the end of the world, and I'm going to tell you, as Christians, part of thinking Christianly about anything is thinking, Biblically, and that means, by the way, filled with the Spirit of God and interpreting His Word with the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of truth. He'll guide us in all truth. And I'm also going to tell you that the Holy Spirit's not going to tell you to do something that the, the Word of God, the written Scripture, and Jesus Christ during His life didn't tell you to do. They always work together. So thinking Christianly about any subject is thinking biblically about it. But here's something else I want to bring to your attention, that... Thinking Christianly about a subject also means thinking historically about it. Do you know Christianity is one of the world's religions that's rooted in history? So Thomas Cahill, who wrote this book called The Gift of the Jews, said that Jewish people actually gave history the concept of time that's going somewhere, that's not cyclical. Most other religions have a view of the world as cyclical. You know, incarnation, things repeat time after time, but the Jewish people, Cahill argues, and I think he's right, gave the world this idea that God started it somewhere in Eden, and that time is, God's doing something in time, and is going somewhere, and Christianity doesn't get rid of that. Jesus comes in time, incarnated into our time, and says we're going somewhere. So we can talk about the end of time, because God gave us time. So we're going to think biblically, we're going to think historically. And the first thing we're going to do is admit that as human beings, we have a penchant, we have a tendency to kind of be into apocalypticism. That means into things about the end, into speculation about the end. We humans, 
We like to think we're in like the end generation, and it's nothing new as we'll find out in a minute. So the next section, we're going to deal with history for a few minutes. So this is going to be part history, part Bible teaching, okay? Buckle up, here we go. So you've heard people predict that the end is near, perhaps, over the last year. And if you've been tempted to anxiety about that, this is especially for you. If you've been anxious at all, like what's going to happen? The world seems bleak. Is it the end? What's going to happen? If you've been anxious, that's the people that I really had a heart for when I wrote this. If you've been dealing with anxiety over the state of the world, over what's going to happen, I want to put everything into historical context. And at first I want to give kind of a warning. If you are a person tempted towards cynicism, the study of past predictions of the end of the earth will probably hit your cynicism button pretty hard. So just don't give in to it, because I'm pretty convinced that God doesn't use cynicism. That is a tool of the enemy. Cynicism just makes us awful people. So like, put your cynicism to the back. I'm not saying don't be thinking. I'm just saying don't let yourself say, like, everything's crazy because a few people were. Okay? All right. Now let's get to some of these things. If you want to, <laughs> if you're really cynical, you can't do this. But if you really want to see something interesting, go to Wikipedia. Now I know Wikipedia, your teachers out here, like Wikipedia is not where you end your research. Of course it isn't, but it's a great place to start. It shows you where to go, shows you what has been said, and then you can do some other things. But for something like this, Wikipedia is actually kind of interesting and helpful. So if you type in list of dates predicted for the apocalyptic events, into, Wiki, into Google and you find Wikipedia, you'll find 12 pages of predictions, some past, many past, some still looming, so be ready. Let me highlight a couple. So in Pope Innocent, and we're going to hit all kinds of Protestants, we're going to hit Catholics, we're going to hit all kinds of people. And by the way, not all the predictions were Christian, but we're going to hit Christian ones today. So Pope Innocent, who died in 1216, predicted that the world would end in 1284. Well, it hasn't. But why did he make that prediction? Because that was 666, 666 years after the founding of Islam. All right? Now, we're going we're gonna to see a couple of things to note in this. First of all, I want to note, if you're going to predict the world's end, it's always good to do it after you're dead. Okay, then you don't deal with the repercussions. Just so if any of you are wanting to predict the end of the world, please do yourself and all of us a favor, make it after you're dead, okay? Secondly, you see this numbers thing. What we'll see as a common theme is someone, this, in this case a pope, finding a number that really stands out to them and running with it. So 666 in Revelation, the mark of the beast, he says, well, 666 years after the founding of Islam, which is, obviously, Jesus must come back after that. Well, he didn't, right? Then in the 14th century, in the mid-1300s, there were a lot of predictions about the end of the world because there was this thing going around the world, this pandemic called the Black Plague. And few things get our end of the world radar up like pandemics. And there were a number of people predicting that this was indeed the end. No, it wasn't the end. Europe lost a huge percentage of its population, but it wasn't the end of the world. And then we had the Reformation, and after the Reformation, we even had Protestants get involved. Like, none of us are, uh, can wash our hands of this. The German Anabaptist Tom and Thomas Munzer said that the 1525 was going to mark the millennium. He was going to set up a utopian city. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. That city was burned. He lost his head after being tortured, and his, many of his followers died. All right, so second lesson. If you're going to follow someone saying it's the end of the world, make sure that person's looking out for you and not his own best interests, or you might die along with them. Okay? Then we have one. There was a prediction made that the world would end in 1658. Now, this was made in 1501 by none other than Christopher Columbus. He said that the world would end 7,000 years after its beginning, which he wagered was five, the year 5,343 5, B.C. That is pretty specialized chronological work right there. Right? 
Do you see this numbers theme, right? And it happened on our shores too. American Puritan leader Cotton Mather, the Mather name was pretty famous in New England circles, predicted the world would end because to Puritans it was just getting worse and worse. How could it, Jesus not come back? None of us are ever tempted to that, right? He said it'd end in 1697, but then it didn't. And he made the faux pas of predicting it'd end during his lifetime. So he had to alter it. So then he said 1716, but then it didn't end then. And then he said 1736, which I do believe is after he passed. So that, he was okay there. My favorite actually happened in 1806 in England, where this really enterprising woman found a way to inscribe on eggs, Jesus is coming, in a kind of ink that etched itself into the egg, and then she put the eggs into the chicken again. And the chicken had these eggs, and she said, oh my goodness, it's a sign. Until they found out that she had somehow found a way to get the egg back in the chicken, okay? Watch out for signs that seem too good to be true, okay? Not every trumpet blast is the Spirit of God, okay? Now, again, we've always had this penchant to think we're living in a definitive time, right? How many elections, if you've lived a long ways, have, have they said, this is the election to end all election, it's the most important election in our lifetime? I think that happens every four years, if I have learned anything in my short life. We always think we're living in the crucial moment, probably especially we Americans. But what we see in history is that these ideas about the end times actually ramp up near the beginning of the 1800s, and there's a reason for it. Historically, the French Revolution in 1792 turned so many Christians toward thinking about prophetic books in a way they hadn't before. Because if you know anything about the French Revolution, it comes just a few years after the American, but unlike the American Revolution, the French Revolution was completely anti-clerical, that means anti-priest and minister, anti-God. It was a thoroughly secular revolution. It upended society, and everyone thought this must be the beginning of the end. And they turned to the prophetic books in a way they hadn't. And what we see happening is some of the largest, most widespread speculation about the end of time happens right after that. And it's actually a shift that happens. So prior to that, most of the Puritans had a theology or an eschatology. This is, this is a theological one and a historical one. Just buckle up, okay? They had an eschatology, which means the study of the end things a theology or an eschatology that was mostly post-millennial. What that meant is they thought the world would get better and better and then Jesus would eventually come because they were going to purify it and make it better. That's Puritan, right? That's what they're about, creating new Israel, God's society on earth. But what happens after the French Revolution, as the dominant reason why, it's not the only but the dominant, is we turn toward what we would say is a pre-millennial theology, eschatology. That means people think the world's only going to get worse, so Jesus is definitely going to come before and rescue us from this world because the world's just going to be destroyed. And that way of thinking has pretty much dominated the evangelical church and the fundamentalists and then the evangelicals, again, kind of a historical thing there, since that time, premillennialists. This idea the world's going to get worse and worse, it's going to hell in a handbasket, like Moody said, get a lifeboat and save all you can. That's the thinking that has pretty much dominated evangelicalism, fundamentalism. But some of these people actually made pretty specific claims. So there's this guy in America in the early 1800s named William Miller. And he, in, he's a Baptist layperson. And in 1828, right, this is still... He lived through the French Revolution. He's seen some things come and go. In 1828, he decided that by his calculation, Jesus was going to return in 1834. He had calculated through the prophetic books and looked a lot at Daniel. Daniel's one of those books people go to for these kind of things over and over. He had made these prophecies, kind of equating days with years and doing some numerical work. There's almost always numerical work involved. 
that the world was going to end. And then he was helped by an event that happened in 1837, the Great Panic, where America's economic bottom fell out and there was a depression that lasted through the 1840s. The cotton prices were slashed. In certain parts of America, 25% of the population was out of work. This last spring, we had about those percentages for just a month, and you know what it felt like? It felt like everyone had lost their job. Panics always help these things. So from 1839, in the wake of this depression, economic depression and panic, he gained 50,000 converts to what was becoming his denomination, and they were all professing that the world was going to end in 1843. And then he, it didn't end in 1843, you know, spoiler alert. But he set a specific date for March 21st, 1844. And in some cases, people climbed to the top of their roofs in white linen. People were on board. They were climbing trees. They were getting ready for the return. They were going to be taken away. But then it didn't happen. And I thought this was an interesting turn of events. Brought a few props today. So meetings grew larger and larger for William Miller and converts more numerous. But on March 21st, 1844, it came and time continued. On May 2nd, Miller confessed his error and acknowledged his disappointment. But one of his followers called attention to Habakkuk 2.3 in Leviticus 25.9 and announced that there was obviously going to be a, quote, tarrying time of seven months and ten days. So guess what William Miller did? He calculated it out, seven months and ten days, and October 22nd, 1844 was the new day. Everyone did it again, and again, the world didn't end. And they call this, in American religious history, the Great Disappointment. Think about it, 50,000 at least people thought this was the day, and then it wasn't. And they left jaded, disappointed, and in fact, many of them flowed over from Miller, who was discredited for the rest of his life, into the following, a woman named Ellen G. White, who started a denomination that still exists, the Seventh-day Adventists. White told all these people that were disappointed, if you just have the Sabbath on the right day, i.e. Saturday, Jesus will come back. That's what you did wrong. That's why it didn't work. And hence the Seventh-day Adventists were formed. So we had William Miller in America. Now across the pond, we had this guy named John Nelson Darby. And in the 1830s, at almost exactly the same time, you see this is global stuff, even back then, at about the same time, he developed this eschatology called dispensationalism. And he said that there were seven dispensations in the world and that at the end of the, the seventh one, Jesus would return. And his big new development was this idea of the secret rapture. So if you ever were afraid when you walked in a room and someone you expected to be there wasn't there, and you were ever afraid you were left behind, you have this Britain, British guy to thank for it, okay? Darby. And it... it Took a little while because Americans were jaded from the Great Disappointment, but by the 1870s and into the early 20th century, Americans were really buying in, and eventually this became the predominant way that fundamentalists and evangelicals thought about the end of the world. It was helped by a guy named Schofield who wrote a reference Bible where the notes interpreted the Bible in this way in 1909. And other people came along, the Ryrie Study Bible has notes that interpret the Bible this way. And this is just a teaching point. The Bible that you have, if it's a study Bible, someone wrote those notes, and that person had a theological bent. It was not just a, you know, a baseline, they have no theological bent. Whoever wrote the notes in your study Bible has a theology, and those, that theology comes through. So the notes are not uh, inspired by God, but the Bible is, okay? Just, just so you know that. And then, some of you have lived through this one, you are looking at the best-selling book other than the Bible of the 1970s. Not Christian book, best-selling book. Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth. Anyone live through that and remember that? Yeah. Best-selling book in the 70s. I'm telling you, there's money to be made if you write these books. Left Behind books sold 
eight, 80 million copies. If you go to Liberty University, you go to Moody, they have buildings named for Tim LaHaye because he made so much money predicting the end and talking about the end. Best-selling book of the 70s was a campus crusade worker who wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. What are these, what am I, why am I telling you all this? Most of these predictions were meant to stoke fears that interpreted the most positively were to stoke people's fears so they would convert to Jesus. Interpreted negatively, you know, I don't know why they would do it, but to, to hopefully get people to convert, right? People were afraid, oh my goodness, I might be left behind. You know, the, the, the uh, Larry Norman songs and all that. And the other is, they were trying to offer a clear-eyed vision in the face of catastrophe or, or chaos, right? What I want to assert today, and we're going to pivot here, that was a very brief historical overview. Very brief. But I want to pivot to a biblical approach here at this point. So you've seen kind of what's out there. The, the thing I want to argue right now is that in many cases, these people were, maybe they were trying their best, but they in many cases downplayed the spirit and the overall emphasis of the Bible and gave extraordinary, and I would argue uh, too much, weight to obscure passages, and they had too much confidence in their ability to make the numbers work. And as we've seen, every time someone tried to make the numbers work in any way that we could test, the numbers didn't work. Ever. So what I want to do is redirect us to the Bible, because we'll find that the Bible does guarantee a few things about the end. And we'll also find that it shows us how to live in, in light of it, okay? Okay. So first I want to go to the guarantee. This is the guarantee we need to hear. Matthew 24. So in Matthew 24, and I'll wait for you to turn there, get there on your phone. We're going to jump around a little bit today, but it's really, I just encourage you to bring a Bible and, or a phone and follow along, take some notes, or else if you're like me, you'll forget 90-something percent. Maybe you're better than I am. You'll forget 80-something percent of what you heard. But this is Jesus talking to his disciples. It's near the end of his ministry, right about before he's going to be crucified. They're coming from the temple. They're overwhelmed by the majesty of the temple. And they start asking him about the end, because Jesus has made some kind of cryptic predictions. Now, the first half of Matthew 24, primarily, I'm just going to tell you, primarily talks about the fall of Jerusalem, which Jesus says will be in your generation. And it does come in 70 A.D., and he talks about how horrible it's going to be for those who are living there. And it was. I mean, they were surrounded by Rome for years, and it was horrible inside those walls. But after that, he turns to the second, his second coming, the end. And listen to what he says in Matthew 24, verse 36. But concerning that day, an hour, talking about when he comes again, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What I want to emphasize here, is the basic guarantee that Jesus gives his people in this passage is this. You can be guaranteed that no one knows when I'm coming. So anytime, this is the first thing we're going to take away from this, anytime someone says, I know when Jesus is coming, they've already not heeded this uh, decree, this guarantee by Jesus. No one knows. There's a big difference from people saying, I think it's going to be soon, to people saying, it's going to be March 21st, 1844. You can automatically write them off. You can pray for them. No one knows. 
Because when March 22nd comes, they're going to need a lot of prayer and love, okay? No one knows. And what's he follow it up by? It's always interesting to see what's, what follows up these, these things. He has the parable of the ten virgins. Remember, five kept their lamps burning. Five were ready for the bridegroom to come. Five weren't. And then he has the parable of the three of the gifts of the talents. The three, the three individuals, right? One received a ten, one received uh, five, um, one received one. They handled it differently. And basically one was, two were ready to use it well, one wasn't. It's all about being prepared and working. It's about a way of life, actually. It's about using the time before the master comes well. And that's kind of what I want to encourage us on this morning and, and pivot toward. So we know that Jesus says, no one knows the time, only the Father. So the first thing you can do is when you hear someone say, it's coming this year. No, they don't know. They have no idea it's coming this year. Don't let that cause you anxiety. What we can do is join the church universal that has always said, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come, and lived in light of his soon return. Lived as people who know he will return and who want to be ready, like the five young virgins who were waiting for the bridesmaid with their lamps lit with oil, unlike the ones who had let them burn out. Like the two servants who used their time to steward the master's talents well, unlike the one who said, I don't know, I'm a, I have a paralysis of anxiety, I'm just going to hide it. And the master said, what were you doing with your time? It's in Matthew 25, you can read it on your own if you don't know the story. And then, talking about a way of life. Look what the next part of Matthew 25 is. It's about the final judgment. But listen to what Jesus says. So this is right after the, the five uh, bridesmaids who were faithful with keeping their lamps lit, the others weren't, right after the two servants who invested their time and their talent well for their master and the one didn't. And then Jesus says this. When the Son of Man comes, this is Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all nations. He will separate people from one another as shepherds separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous will answer and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did you, you see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. And then he looks to the people on the other side. Then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared from the devil for his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they'll answer, Lord, when did we see you naked or hungry or sick? in prison and didn't minister you. And then he'll answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now that is a sobering passage. Jesus is talking about the end of Jerusalem. It's sobering enough. Then he goes to his second coming. He says, no one knows. But he talks about a way of life in the meantime. And that is what bothers me so much when we get into this uh, speculation about exactly when the end's going to come and exactly what it's going to look like, is we lose the way of life that Jesus explicitly calls us to in hopes of searching for the perfect teacher who has the perfect prophetic angle, who has calculated the numbers the best. And we get so wrapped up in that that we lose the way of life living as people who know Jesus could come at any time. And when he comes, I want to be about the master's business. 
And what's even more likely is I could pass at any time. My life could be over. We're like grass in the field. When my hour comes, I want to be about the master's business, about Jesus' business, loving God with all my heart and loving my neighbor as myself. We always, always have a tendency to want to look into like the mysteries instead of just doing the plain things in front of us. We live in a culture addicted to like the special event and the big conference when the daily rhythms are where Jesus shows up time after time. One of my favorite passages to talk about the kingdom of God is a strange parable that doesn't get preached on a heck of a lot, but it's Matthew 13. It's just a few chapters back. It comes right after the parable of the sower. Jesus is talking about average everyday things, sowing seed. And then he's talking about an average everyday thing, weeds in your crops in Matthew 13, 24. If you've gardened, unless you're really, really good, but if my, my family gardens, we know all about weeds in the crops, okay? Jesus is preaching about everyday life, but he's also talking about kingdom things. Listen to what he says. He put another parable before them in Matthew 13, 24. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, when the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said, Then do you want us to go and gather it up? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them into bundles that to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And this is one of the parables that Jesus actually explains in verse 36. I'm not going to read it. You can read it for yourself. But he basically says, the, the good wheat are the people I've called to myself that are serving me. The tares are the people that have bought into the enemy's lies. And, and are, are serving him. And look what he does. He doesn't have, this is, we're not talking about some secret rapture of all the good wheat and leave the bad ones. We're talking about at the end, Jesus comes back, the harvester comes back and deals with both. And what did the good wheat do? Simply live into its identity. It made wheat. It grew. I think this is so instructive for us. When God comes back, Jesus tells his disciples, there'll be no denying when he returns. We're not, we don't need to worry about some secret like, oh, someone's gone. There'll be no denying when Jesus comes. Remember, the idea of a secret rapture was never in the church until 1830. Novel theology is always something we should be a little careful about. When Jesus returns, he's going to separate things. What are we called to do? Just like that song we sing. Remember what we sing? I'm no victim, but I am who you say I am. You are a little Christ, a Christian. You've put on Christ. Those of you who are baptized, you've been buried with Christ in baptism, raised again with Him in newness of life. That's why we say remember your baptism. Now our task, our mindset, is to live in that identity. And if we do that, we don't need to worry about when the end's coming because we're ready. We're simply being the people God's called us to be. We're seeing the people in need and we're ministering to them. The wheat remains firm in its identity no matter what weeds grow around it. We like to, we, I don't know, if you're like me, you like to blame the culture. Oh, it's so hard to live right now, you know. We got this wave of secularism and there's all this stuff around sexuality and there's, I mean, man, it's hard to live right now. It's hard to, hard to follow Jesus. It's always been hard to follow Jesus. During the Roman Empire, during the, you know, the church was huge in Persia and as the Muslim 
wave took over the peninsula, it was hard to follow Jesus. Literally second-class citizens. It's always been hard to follow Jesus. But he calls us to be his people. To remember identity. We're not the weeds. Now, we don't get to decide either, by the way. He decides who's a weed and who's the wheat. So before we start getting too crazy on that one. But we are his people. Remember your identity. Live in it now. It's a way of life, not a speculation about the day or the way the world's going to end. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 5. Remember, we read this through this uh, book together a few months back. And one of the chapters, passage I like the most comes in the fifth chapter. In Ephesians 5, he says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Let's, let's be awake, right? Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Paul said that in the first century. It hasn't changed. The days have been evil. Humans have done horrible things to each other the whole way through. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, be awake. You see the things he talks about? He's like, I mean, when, when we... Uh, our gluttons on anything, it dulls our senses. He talks about alcohol here. He's like, don't be drunk. Don't have your senses dulled. Be alert. Be awake. Be ready. Even if we're surrounded by evil, we are called to make the best use of our time. It's a way of life. It means to praise God and bring Him glory, Paul says in this passage. It also means to treat our neighbors right. If the church would put as much time into thinking about how to love their neighbor who's different from them, to love their neighbor who votes differently politically, to love their neighbor who shares beliefs that you can't, instead of trying to figure out what day exactly Jesus is going to come and when the trump is going to sound, we know he's coming. And we also know no one knows when, so let's live on mission. Let's bring glory to God. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ, treating each other like the infinitely valuable people all of us are. It's a way of life. We have the guarantee, no one knows, but it's a way of life, of living knowing he could come at any time. But what's even more likely is our life could pass at any time. But when those things happen, whichever comes first, we know if we're in Christ, we have a hope of life after death, a hope of the kingdom of God where every tear is wiped away. And everything wrong with this creation, it's going to be a new heaven, new earth. He's going to set creation to rights. It's going to make it new and right. So it's a frame of mind. A couple weeks ago, I touched on Ephesians 9. We're almost done. And there's this great passage. Remember, I was reading about the priesthood and how Jesus was sacrificed once for all. He is our great high priest. We don't need a yearly sacrifice. We were in numbers talking about how the tabernacle worked and stuff. And I read this passage out of Hebrews 9 that I want to come back to today. And it's in Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ has entered, not into the holy places made with, with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Remember, he's making intercession for us. He's praying for us. That should encourage our hearts. It wasn't to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's the cross. 
Paul calls, the writer of Hebrews calls it the end of the ages because everything changed. The cross was a definitive hinge point in history and the resurrection is all one thing. They go together. He triumphed over death by death. And then listen to this. We get in to talk about the end. And just as is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, we're not getting away from that. We each will be judged, and if we're not covered by the blood of the Lamb, we'll face the penalty of our sin. But listen to this next verse. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I said there's a guarantee that no one knows when. I said there's a way of life. Living now, fully awake, looking after those who are hungry, looking after those who are in prison, looking after those who need the gifts of charity and mercy. Living on mission. It's a way of life, but there's also a frame of mind. And unfortunately, so much of what passes for speculation about the end on cable talk shows and all these the places takes us from this frame of mind. Most of them instill fear in us and anxiety. Oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's just getting worse and worse. The writer of Hebrews says he's coming for those who what? Eagerly await. As the New Testament says another place, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. There is no reason to be afraid in the face of Jesus' coming. He does all things well. And He will redeem your life and He will redeem this creation well. There is no need to be anxious, no need to be fearful, and whatever person speaking that fear into you, pray for them. Because that is not the way we Christians are supposed to live, no matter what pandemic's going on, no matter what wars happen, no matter what persecution we face, no matter what sickness hits us. We live as people who know where we're going because we know who is accompanying us there. Jesus Christ. Remember, you will say goodbye to every person you love, every single one, and you'll cross the threshold of death with only one person, Jesus Christ. He's the only one you never, ever will say goodbye to. He's our guarantee, He's our hope, and He's our way into it. We don't have to be afraid. We should be on mission. Because there are a lot of people who are afraid out there. Because they don't have that hope. Or they've forgotten it. They don't know their identity. Or they've forgotten it. The wheat in that field wasn't afraid of the harvest. The stewards who invested well weren't afraid. The Five who kept their lamps burning, who were ready, went into joy to the wedding feast. Let's be eagerly anticipating the coming. We don't need to know when. We just need to know it's going to happen. The when questions often derail us. Have you ever seen someone lose their focus to love God and love people because they got so neck deep in prophetic speculation and this or that Bible study and this or that prophetic Bible that they got lost in the weeds and the enemy has a field day. Love God. Love people. The main and the plain is our starting point. We eagerly await. It's not escapism for us. It's reunion. Union with Christ. And then lastly, the end doesn't justify the means. Remember, the end is the means for Christians. Jesus is the end we're shooting for, to be in his presence. He is also the means of getting there. So anytime we think, put a little fear of God in them, 
talk about the end, talk about the end of the world, make them a little afraid. We're using a means to get to an end that's not going to take us where we want to go. Jesus is the means of getting to the end, which is also Him. He will set creation right. He has said He's preparing a place for us. He will drive out death and pain and sorrow along with all evil and darkness and unrighteousness. There is no place in the kingdom of God. And the Bible tells us we've all sinned and fall short of that glory, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, human beings want utopia because God's programmed utopia in our hearts because it looks like the kingdom of God. And every human plan, if you look at it, is for utopia, right? Honestly, if you break down this election, it's for two competing ideas of what utopia looks like, all given to us by a politician on the right or the left. In a secular society, we give up our, our ideas of the kingdom of God and we settle for political utopias. But guess what? Every utopia will fail us and it will turn on us. Ask the people in Russia. Ask the, ask the people under Mao in China. Every utopian vision will eat us up. It will turn on us except for the kingdom of God. We human beings can't create utopia on our own. Sure, do we strive for better and better? Do we strive for the Beatitudes and Matthew 5 and 6 to look more and more like reality? Yes, we do, because we pray in the church on a weekly basis, may your will be done, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as in heaven. We want that. But we'll never make a perfect society. The only true utopia is the kingdom of God. It's coming. No one knows when. But we do know what our lifestyle and our mindset should be. Eagerly waiting. Actively living. In light of the goodness of Jesus. It's not live like you're dying, as much as I like Tim McGraw. It's live like you've already died and you're alive again. Because you went under in baptism and you came up. Live like you're living. And it will be contagious. Faith trumps fear. Hope is more powerful than angst. Mission beats paralysis of fear every day. Spirit-filled and led action has to triumph over complacency in the church. And we will all be able to pray. And we all pray in our hearts, Jesus, right now. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Jesus, right now I pray that you would remind us of your goodness. And if there's fear... in any hearts that you would drive it away. That you would call people to the life and that you would let them follow in the life that you've called them to, God. And may we be a light in the darkness. In the name of Jesus, amen. At this time, we're going to go to communion. And we're going to start by praying that prayer Jesus taught us to pray. That reminds us that we are praying for his kingdom to come. And as we pray, we remember we can't bring it. Only he can. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gave the disciples a foretaste of the feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb that was to come in the kingdom of God. And the church has handed this on generation after generation to remind ourselves how to eagerly wait for his coming. But we always come with humility. We can't bring the kingdom. Our utopias always fail. Our dates that we say that Jesus is going to do something, that he's going to come back, they always fail. It's him. He brings, he's the king. He brings the kingdom. And he brings us into it. He brings us to the table. If you don't know him, today's the day. Let this be the way that you enter in. Let's take a minute and confess if there are things in our lives that we've hung on to harder than we've hung on to him. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And he does. And he says, come to my table. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what John tells us. And we claim that. Yes, God, forgive us. Cleanse us. Let us be your people. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Eat and drink in remembrance of him. Let's stand and sing one more revelation song appropriately named song gets its name because it's taken from Revelation. And this is some of the things that we're going to sing around the throne of God. We're going to be pointing to him and his goodness. So let's sing it together. on heaven's mercy seat worthy is the lamb who was slain holy holy is he sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king oh holy holy Oh 
get to the kingdom, but he is at the center of the kingdom. He's the means and the end. Don't worry about when exactly he's coming. He's coming. With the church for 2,000 years, we say, Maranatha, come. And let's live today in light of that. It's a way of life. It's a mindset. We're eagerly waiting, but we're not per paralyzed by fear. So may the good God, the soon and coming King, may He bless you this week. May He keep you this week. May He cause His face to shine on you this week and may He give you peace. Go! Be intentional. Be missional wherever He sent you. And tell someone when he meets you there, because he will. He has a mission for you. Let's live like we're living. I'll see you next week.